Indeed, we have 10,000 upon 10,000 reasons to bless the Lord. And if you're looking for a couple more, look no further than Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and following. Of this paragraph that we'll be talking about today, Martin Luther wrote, it is the chief point and the very central place in the epistle, that's Paul's letter, and the whole Bible. Martin Luther said this is the chief point of the whole Bible. A commentator named Donald Gray Barnhouse wrote, I am convinced today, after many years of Bible study, that these verses are the most important in the Bible. We can go even bigger than that. Leon Morris once wrote this, this is possibly the single most important paragraph ever written. Isn't that wild? Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and following, possibly the single most important paragraph ever written written. Now, I'm not going to try to defend that argument today, but Leon Morris does have a point. This is a very important paragraph. So I know that typically we start with kind of a 30,000 foot view, don't we? We get a kind of a broad strokes view of the passage, and then we work our way into the more granular details of it. But today we're going to do it the other way around. It's just going to take us a couple weeks to get through this passage. It's just so unbelievably packed with meaning. So we're going to narrow our focus to just kind of a laser beam. We're going to focus on one word. Yep, just one word. Let's read the passage together, and then I'll indicate what word we're focusing on today. Ready? Paul says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. We've been talking about that already a little bit although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, my friends. There's our word. We're going to circle it once in pink. We're going to circle it once in green. We're going to double circle this bad boy because that is where we'll focus our time and energy today. Let's finish the text. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. Once again, Leon Morris called this possibly the most important paragraph ever written. And we're going to zero our attention onto this one word right here because it, it is so packed with meaning. Say it with me, propitiation. It's kind of fun, propitiation. And in order to understand this word, We've got to go back to the Old Testament. Remember that Paul has been talking quite a bit about God's covenant people. He's been talking to God's covenant people, that is to say the Jews, because Paul himself is Jewish and he's addressing the Jews directly. So the Jews would have had a kind of a unique understanding of this word propitiation based on their Old Testament history and their pedigree. Remember that the nation of Israel was enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. And then God called a redeemer named Moses to go into Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. A little bit of a conversation ensued between Moses and Pharaoh and even God and Pharaoh. And eventually uh, the nation of Egypt let the nation of Israel go and they began to uh, traverse across the Sinai Peninsula toward the promised land. And while they were journeying toward the promised land, God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai and gave him the Ten Commandments and instructed him to construct what's called a tabernacle. Now, this tabernacle that God instructed Moses to construct uh, was a portable kind of tent where God's presence dwelt. And inside the tent, there was a holy place. And inside the holy place, there was the most holy place. And inside that most holy place, there was something called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark was a small box and it was plated in gold. And the nation of Israel carried it wherever it went. 
And God also instructed Moses to make a lid, a covering for this Ark of the Covenant. And listen very closely to the details here. We typically don't read passages of Scripture that are quite this long, but but listen to the detail uh, that God gives Moses in Exodus chapter 25. And God refers to this lid of the Ark of the Covenant as a mercy seat. Exodus chapter 25, verse 17, uh, God says, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work shall you make them, on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on one end, that's an angel, and a cherub on the other end. And one piece of one piece with the mercy seat, you shall make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread their wings out above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces to one another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you, that is, the commandments uh, that God wrote Himself on tablets of stone. Uh, Additionally, inside that ark of the covenant was Aaron's staff and a jar of manna. We don't have time to get into that today. Verse 22, God says there, specifically referring to the mercy seat, I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. We heard that word mercy seat repeated a few times there. And I know it's kind of awkward language, mercy seat. What does that really mean? Other versions of scripture uh, translate it as atonement cover. The original word, is kaparet, that's the Hebrew word for lid or covering. It's also closely related to the Hebrew word kapur, as in yom kapur, the day of atonement. So this word kaparet can be translated as lid or covering. It could also be translated as atonement or cleansing. And again, it's awkward in the English language because we don't really have a word for word kind of translation here, but mercy seat or atonement cover is probably the best that we can do. And this transparent lid on top of the Ark of the Covenant came to represent a few things for the nation of Israel. And, And please hear me, this atonement cover, this mercy seat, this lid on the Ark of the Covenant was so incredibly important for the nation of Israel and for Hebrew culture and for Hebrew religion and for the ways that they interacted with God. Because number one, it represented for them God's manifest presence. If you're jotting down notes, jot down uh, mercy seat equals God's presence. Once again, let's revisit what we just read. God says, there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. God is saying, I will manifest my presence on this mercy seat. I will manifest my presence on this mercy seat. And again, for the nation of Israel, this was very unique and very different on the kind of the global landscape or the known world at the time. Because any other country or any other religion or any other faith system or practice would have had representations of God's, but they wouldn't have the manifest presence of God. In this case, the one and only God. So for the nation of Israel, this mercy seat came to represent God's presence. The caporet served as the manifestation of God's physical presence on earth with his people. Second, the caporet, the mercy seat, represented God's glory. It represented God's glory. Let's look at the book of Leviticus, Leviticus uh, chapter 16, verse 2. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark. There's our word again, isn't it? Why is God saying, don't come inside the holy place, that most holy place? Uh, Don't come inside just kind of at any time before the mercy seat. Let's finish the verse. So that he may not die. 
God says, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. This is the deal. Anyone who comes face to face with the glory of God, as Isaiah would say, comes undone, comes unglued. In other words, God is saying, if you come face to face with my glory in all of its splendor and I completely unveil it, you're going to die, Aaron. So don't just waltz in there at any time. I will give you a specific time, a specific day that was once a year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is a protective measure because anyone who comes face to face with God's glory will die. That's why there's a cloud over the mercy seat in order to conceal God's glory just a little bit in order to protect Aaron. So once again, this caparet, this mercy seat, came to represent a couple of things for the nation of Israel. First, God's manifest presence on earth. Second, God in all His glory and all His splendor. Third, it came to represent God's mercy. Again, if you're jotting down notes, just jot that down. Mercy seat equals God's mercy. It would have been synonymous for the nation of Israel with God's presence, God's glory, and God's mercy. Because on that one day a year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, God commanded the priest, the first one being Aaron and subsequent priest after him, only the high priest and only once a year, to come before that most holy place and come before the mercy seat and offer a sacrifice on behalf of himself first, and then the sins of the people. It's outlined in Leviticus 16, verses 11 through 16, and we're gonna read it in its entirety. Once again, a little longer text, but pay close attention because this is why the mercy seat came to represent God's mercy. Leviticus 16, verse 11, Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself, and he shall take a censer full of coals from the fire from the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger in front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. This is the sin offering for himself. Verse 15, then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus, listen closely, he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall do so for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. See, on the mercy seat, God is seated and this is the place from whence God dispenses his mercy. He receives sacrifice on behalf of the sins of the people and clears their transgressions away from them as far as the east is from the west, buried in the deepest ocean to be remembered no more. And you might be asking yourself, listen, okay, I kind of get that, but why is it that a blood sacrifice was required in order to remove the sins of the people? Why doesn't God just kind of forget about sin? Why can't God just forgive without an animal paying with its life? Well, here's the reason why, is that forgiveness always costs someone something. It really does. Forgiveness always costs someone something. Think about it. Uh, Matt is on the other side of this camera right now. Great guy. Let's say Matt loaned me 10 bucks. And Matt's that kind of guy that he would loan me 10 bucks. And let's say a week later, I say to Matt, Matt, just want you to know, I'm not going to pay you back. In order for Matt to forgive me, what's it going to cost him? 10 bucks. Somebody's got to pay for it. Matt just can't make money appear out of thin air. If he extends grace and mercy and forgives me, He's going to eat the cost, in this case, 10 bucks. So when Adam and Eve, original man and original woman, sinned, what they did was they ignored and rejected God, thus ignoring and rejecting life. And if you ignore and reject life, what do you earn for yourself? Death. 
Makes sense, doesn't it? This is why Paul says the wages of sin is death. What you've earned because of your sin is death. So this is why God commands the nation of Israel to sacrifice an animal in order to pay for the sins of the people. The animal is paying with its life because forgiveness always costs somebody something. And in this case, what God is saying is, I can't just sweep that under the rug. You still got to pay with your life. But instead of making you pay, what I'm going to do is allow an animal to pay with its life. The animal pays the blood sacrifice and God therefore forgives and cleanses the sins of the people on that one day of atonement, Yom Kippur, when the high priest went in before the mercy seat and sacrificed an animal on behalf of the people. Remember where we're at here. And if you're not tracking with me, we're going to go deeper. But here we go. Let's just summarize what we've learned is that this caparet, this atonement cover, over the Ark of the Covenant in the nation of Israel was so extraordinarily special. And it came to represent three things, God's presence, God's glory, and God's mercy. And you also might be thinking, Luke, <laughs> what in the world does this have to do with Romans chapter three? Well, here's what it has to do with Romans chapter three. When the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, that word kaporet became hilasterion. It's the Greek word, hilasterion. And 21 of 27 times that that word is used in the Greek Old Testament, that's the Septuagint, hilasterion refers to the mercy seat, the atonement cover. Go back to our passage. Whom God put forward as a hilasterion. That's the Greek word for propitiation. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that Jesus is the mercy seat. If you're jotting down notes, jot that down, that Jesus is the mercy seat. He's not literally a lid. He's not literally an atonement cover, but Paul is using this concept that his Jewish brothers and sisters most certainly would have understood to help them understand the role and nature of Jesus and his blood. Listen to what Doug Moo writes in his commentary about this very verse. He says, when the Roman Christians came to the word hilasterion, they immediately would have thought of the day of atonement ritual and all that it means. Those yearly days of atonement are now fulfilled in the one great day of atonement when Christ died on a Roman cross for the sins of the world. See, all throughout the Old Testament, we hear whispers of Jesus. We see shadows of Jesus. We see the patriarchs and the tabernacle and the temple begin to point forward to Jesus. And even in this very small covering over the top of the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence and God's glory and God's mercy found their expression, even that points forward to the nature and role of Christ. Jesus is the mercy seat. This is why in John chapter 20, verse 12, by the way, when Mary Magdalene comes into the empty tomb, she sees what? Angels seated at the head and at the foot of the empty linen that has now been vacated by the risen Christ, just as there were cherubim, angels, on each side of the mercy seat. Jesus is the mercy seat. Well, how is Jesus the mercy seat? Well, he does all the same things that the mercy seat did, but he does them in new and completely fulfilled ways. Number one, just as the mercy seat represented God's presence, Jesus is God's physical presence with us. John chapter 1 verse 14 says this, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, literally tabernacled among us. Jesus was the very presence of God to us. And when He left, He gave us His Holy Spirit, who is the very presence of God with us. The mercy seat points forward to that. 
Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says that He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature. See, the mercy seat is where the Shekinah, the glory of God dwelt. But Jesus now is the complete and total manifestation of the glory of God. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Finally, Jesus is God's mercy. This is why 1 John chapter 4 says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus, like that animal in the Old Testament, is now the blood sacrifice. He's the one that takes our death and our shame and our sin upon Himself. He is the one that incurs the justice and judgment and wrath of God so that we may go free, so that God would eat the cost of forgiving us. He provided His Son as a propitiation. See, Jesus, in the same way as the mercy seat in the Old Testament, the hilasterion, is the presence, the glory, and the mercy of God. Now, this notion of propitiation also found meaning in Greco-Roman culture. Because in Greco-Roman culture, uh, men and women would offer sacrifices to gods in order to appease the gods. So when Paul uses this word propitiation, not only would it have some Hebrew meaning, but it would have some Greco-Roman meaning as well. And his listeners and readers would have understood it as an appeasement of the gods. I offer my sacrifice to the gods so that the gods aren't angry with me. That was the Greco-Roman understanding. Well, the Christian notion of propitiation stands in direct contrast to this Greco-Roman understanding for a couple of reasons. One, who does the propitiating? Who is the one that provides uh, this blood sacrifice? Well, it's God Himself. But for our human understanding, we're the ones that either provide a blood sacrifice or an animal sacrifice or a vegetable sacrifice or maybe even the sacrifice of our works. I give God my works so that I decrease His wrath and appease Him and He doesn't pour it out on me. That's not true. God does the propitiating by providing a blood sacrifice in His one and only Son so that His wrath and justice are poured out on Jesus Christ the righteous rather than on you and me. John Stott writes this in his commentary of this very passage. He says, In paganism, man propitiates his gods, and religion becomes a form of commercialism and indeed of bribery. In Christianity, however, God propitiates his wrath by his own actions. He set forth Jesus Christ, says Paul, to be the propitiation for our sins, so that Jesus is the sacrifice so that God can dispense His mercy. Now this notion of propitiation, understanding a couple of things. One, that Jesus is the manifest presence of God, the manifest glory of God, and the manifest mercy of God. Also, that Jesus was the blood sacrifice that died in our place, that lived the life we were meant to live, died the death we were meant to die, paid for our own sin with His body and His blood, with His death on a Roman cross. These are so critical and foundational, not just to what Leon Morris would call the most important paragraph ever written, but to our faith itself. Listen, I just want to read a couple of Bible scholars that talk about this notion of propitiation so we can really wrap our mind around it. Then I want to ask you a question before we go. John Stott wrote this. He says, In the pagan perspective, human beings try to placate their bad-tempered deities with their own paltry offerings. According to the Christian revelation, listen close, God's own great love propitiated His own holy wrath through the gift of His own dear Son, who took our place, bore our sin, and died our death. Charles Cranfield wrote this. He says, God because in His mercy He willed to forgive sinful men, and being truly merciful, willed to forgive them righteously, that is, without in any way condoning their sin, purposed to direct against His own very self in the purpose of his, person of His Son the full weight of that righteous wrath which they deserved. John Murray, 
says the doctrine of the propitiation is precisely this, that God loved the objects of his wrath so much that he gave his own son to the end that they, that he by his blood should make provision for the removal of this wrath. God provided a substitute. Jesus incurred that penalty, shed his own blood, gave his own body so that he would be a propitiation for our sins. Whew. Some heavy theological lifting, wasn't it? Just one word, just one word that will help us understand the broader scope of meaning in this most important paragraph, as Leon Morris would say, that was ever written. We're going to do that a little bit more in the weeks to come. But right now, I want to ask you a question. What if you were God's favorite kid? Serious. What, what if you were God's favorite kid? Not just that God loved you, but he also liked you. And he liked you more than all the other people living on the planet that have ever lived. You were his favorite. How would that change your perspective? How would that change the way you live, the way you see yourself, the way you approach God? Friends, this doctrine of propitiation teaches us this, that God poured his wrath out on his own prized possession, his only son whom he loved, so that you and I did not have to bear his wrath. And not just that, but Jesus also gave us his righteousness, our right standing before God. So we can come before a holy God with confidence, the author of Hebrews says. We can enter the most holy place and experience the presence of God and the glory of God and the mercy of God because Jesus offered his own body as a propitiation. God made a way for our sin to be paid for on the cross and for us to receive the righteousness of God. And so we stand before God as his favorite. That's you. You're his favorite. Don't look at your spouse right now and say, I'm his favorite. <laughs> God doesn't just love you. He likes you. He wants to spend time with you. He made a way for you to do that and at great personal cost to himself. One Bible scholar says this doctrine of propitiation should make us fall on our knees and weep and worship or turn over on our backs and laugh hysterically because this crazy love of God made a way by giving his son as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Thanks for worshiping with us today.